Eddie Chavez Calderon is the campaign organizer for Arizona Jews for Justice and Ori Letzedek, based in Phoenix. He came to the United States from Mexico at the age of four with his mother. He joins me today to discuss his advocacy work and his experience living as an undocumented person here in America. Welcome, Eddie. How are you? I'm hanging in there. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for coming on. Where are you right now? I'm in Phoenix. You're originally from Mexico. When did you come to the United States of America? When I was four years old, my parents divorced and my mom was forced to be a single mother in a very crime-ridden area of Michoacan, Mexico, where she knew that she couldn't have a small child and raised by herself as a single mom. The American dream was the only way that she could raise it. So it's a dangerous neighborhood. Did your mom have a job back in Mexico? She had a job, but you have to think about how, how bad poverty is in those areas. I'm from a very rural area in, in like the mountains of Michoacan, Mexico, which is very hard to make any money, yet alone being able to make money for a child. I am very difficult. So how did you come to the United States of America? It was a really big journey. My mom sold everything she had to be able to get us access all the way from Michoacan, which is uh, pretty down south in Mexico, all the way up to Nogales. I remember my mom would go door to door and ask people that she would do their laundry, she would cook for them, just for enough money for us to have something to eat until we reached the border and we uh, were able to pay for a coyote, right, to be able to bring us through Nogales into Arizona. And you have vivid memories of that as a four-year-old. I think that when you have such a traumatic event in your life, it tends to cling on and it's very difficult to unscrew. While I don't remember things perfectly, I remember certain feelings, scenery, and things that I play in my mind. I talk to my mom about if this happened this way, and we kind of digest the entire journey. When the coyote took you over the border, I understand you got caught, you were put in detention. You were four years old in jail. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you can't be a criminal as a four-year-old. What do you remember about being caught by immigration? I remember this was the first time my mom cried because my my mom asked the border patrol agent if he had water or food for us because at this point we had been walking in scorching desert heat for a long period of time. We were dehydrated and really starving. And he, I remember he looked back and threw a pack of salting crackers at him. And that's when my mother really cried. First time I ever saw her shook and saw her panic. Inside of the detention center, I remember how terribly cold it was. And I remember hearing cry. From children, cries from adults. From adults, consistent. It never stopped. And the lights never turned off. And do you remember how long you were there? We were there for about two days before we were able to see a Border Patrol agent and they did an initial interview. What year was this? This was pre-9-11, 1999. How were you treated back then? Well, we were treated horribly still. My mom was talking to us about how they were pressing to ask her if I was really her child, what our real intentions were, like interrogate my mother and try to pressure her to just almost slip up and say something wrong. So the detention center was from what I've seen the recent images. That's what I remember. They haven't gotten better. The treatment hasn't elevated. Our immigration system has been broken from the beginning and it hasn't had any fixing. So after two days, what happened? Your mom filed for asylum and they released you? It was very odd. Once they they kind of gave us our interview. They kind of just released us. So when they release you, they just open a jail door and tell you to keep walking with no money, no nothing. They bring you back into the border area. There was no wall in that area. There wasn't anything. Right. There you wasn't walk on a highway. Yeah, it, there wasn't hundreds of border patrol drones and military in there. Again, pre 9-11, right? It's amazing. You remember this as a four-year-old. It's amazing. I think that such trauma really embeds itself in you, right? We know folks that survived the Holocaust can really live a lot of what the traumatic events that they lived through when it's something this big. So this is why I'm also able to recollect a lot of those memories, as well as the continuation of sharing stories within our own family members. In the Mexican culture, it's something very prevalent to share stories and share the trauma and acknowledge what you've been through. So you got released, you got, you got stuck on a road, and you start walking to where? We walked to Tucson. How long did it take you to get to Tucson? Do you remember? Oh, man, it was about, I think my mom said she walked for hours, just continuously walking your mom set herself up in Tucson with, with a child? The first thing we did was called her family and let her know that we were okay. We arrived in a Burger King where it was the first time I was able to have an American meal where I had a burger for the first time in my life. Somebody gave me the kid's meal so it had a little toy in it. I remember thinking that I stole something and I, I tried to give it back but the lady was telling us like, no, this is yours, it's free. And th that was the first time I felt joy in the United States of, of getting a free toy. And when did you realize you were 
undocumented? Because you got released, I assume, as a four-year-old. You think, okay, everything's good now. That's a great question. I think for a lot of people in the undocumented community, our families shield us and they try to make us live as normal as possible. Every day I woke up and I said the Pledge of Allegiance. I went to school. I did everything that every normal American child would do. It wasn't really until we would have to identify certain paperwork that things got a little shift where my mom would say, oh, we don't have that or we don't have paper and you shouldn't tell people that we don't have papers. But for me, the biggest realization that I was fully undocumented was in high school when I couldn't get specific scholarships because I didn't have the social security. When I couldn't get a license, when everybody else was getting their driver's license, I couldn't get it. That's a huge blow specifically when you're a teenager, when you're growing into yourself, you're identifying your freedoms, who you are, who you will be. And for a lot of thousands of undocumented people, we have this roadblock in front of us that reminds us consistently that we are other. I understand now your mom's doing well. She has a home in Colorado. How did she make it here? My mom's a fighter. She worked so many jobs. And I remember when I was going to school, she worked on one time up to three jobs where she would get up really early and we would hit buses to try to make sure that she made her work. She dropped me off. She picked me up, made her next job, working at diners, working at sewing machine shop. You name it, my mom did it. She had that fire passion of not giving up and fighting for her child uh, was her number one priority. When did you begin actively protesting? My speaking out and building community power really came about during the attacks after the administration was very vocal about going after immigrants and having a very clear cut of who we're going to go after. Right after that, I believe that was 2017 where the first attack on DACA came. And I knew that I had to step up. I knew that I had DACA, but DACA was only a mandate to try and fix or put a stop into a much bigger problem. But at the same time, there needs to be more voices that are elevated and fighting against the broken systems. Are you fearful of ever being arrested or being targeted for deportation because of your activities? We always are. We're fearful of getting stopped in the light. We're fearful of not coming back any day. If I were to be deported, this isn't a race. This is a marathon where I hand it off to the next person. We try to stay as safe as possible when Whenever we show up any advocacy, but my mom knows why I do this and the reasoning in my heart and why it's so important to protect our communities and stand up because if we don't say anything, decisions will be made for us. How did you feel when the Supreme Court upheld DACA? I guess that made you feel good in the short term. We don't know still what the long term is, but tell me how you felt. I was actually at the Supreme Court for the first initial hearings. I was right outside the Supreme Court. That day was a day of anxiety, a day of fear, a day of unknown. And this day where the Supreme Court upheld DACA. To me, it was a breath of fresh air, a breath that we desperately needed to continue the fight because we knew that coming up in the next week, we were going to get another attack. We understood fully that this was not the end of this battle, that it was only the beginning. You were not born Jewish. You're in the process of converting to Judaism. Correct. But I've been in the community. I've had a Jewish presence that has followed me my entire time. And now I have the ability of having a beautiful mentor, Rabbi Shmuley Yanklowitz, to help me lead my own spiritual pathway as, as well as my mentorship and, and where I am. Why did you decide to convert to Judaism? To me, it always made sense from the activism that the Torah teaches us. I've always tried to have a deeper understanding of religious studies and trying to see what best religion fit me and trying to understand what best matched my spirituality, what best made sense to me. And Judaism always made sense to me. I always felt like there was a Jewish spirit that would surround me. What particularly in Judaism makes the most sense to you? I think Torah commandment of how to treat a stranger more than 36 times in any other commandment where it's specifically told how to treat a stranger because we know far too well what it feels to be the other, knowing and understanding how Jews were treated in Egypt and understanding that systematic Jews have been othered and oppressed and face so much anti-Semitism globally that we have this commandment of saying, you know how it feels. This is how you should treat a stranger. That to me has been one of the most beautiful teachings, as well as diving deep into other studies, um, breaking down the study of Jonah and understanding the complexities of Jonah's journey and the complexity of Moses's journey. Everything really compiles into my own spirituality and how I reflect myself. Mentor is Rabbi Yanklowitz. He's part of of the Jews for Justice and the Ori Let's Set It. Can you tell us about these organizations? Most definitely. So Rabbi Shmuel Yanklowitz is a modern Orthodox rabbi who founded Ori Let's Set It, who looks to mobilize more 
more of the orthodox community into social action, trying to fight back against oppressive systems. And in Arizona Jews for Justice, it's a statewide local organization that looks to combat state issues, focusing on immigration, education, civic engagement, and race relations within the community to try to vocalize and get active. We have our programming in our Tab Hayosher, where we look to bring in an ethical seal of approval for kosher restaurants, ensuring that workers have standard workers' rights, making sure that if I'm at a kosher restaurant and I'm getting ready to eat and I look back and the people making my food are making $2 an hour and getting beat. Right. So we want to make sure we elevate workers' rights as well as providing our anti-racism campaign into the Orthodox community and understanding and building new forms of dialogue so that folks can truly have a breakdown of, of what's going on in our race relationships and how the Orthodox community can stand up. So what was the first campaign you worked on? The very running with our feet starting was during the asylum seeker crisis, uh -huh. where we helped over 40,000 asylum seekers who were released here in Phoenix. And that was Arizona Jews for Justice. And I understand you provided them with food, clothing, shelter. And some of them were very sick. They needed medical care too. Correct. Ariel Atzedek has a group all over the United States. So we would call in volunteers who were in New York, who were in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, so that we would make sure that we had their travel plans from Phoenix to wherever they were going. Because a lot of folks were going to the East Coast. Part of what Arizona Jews for Justice is doing right now is they're putting pressure on both federal and state leadership to give better medical care in the ICE facilities. You know, because we see so many people leaving there sick, especially now with coronavirus ravaging detention centers. What difference do you feel you guys have made? Our advocacy showed truth to power. We had held protests for months in front of the ICE Center here in Phoenix, and we had documented very clearly with doctors and nurses the conditions of folks coming out. We were seeing that folks were coming out with very aggravated late stages of common holds that were turning into much more because they were untreated. We were seeing that sores and cuts were untreated. So we would document along this uh, with our, our group of volunteers. And we were seeing that our advocacy and our pressure was working because folks were coming out more and more healthy to the extent of we weren't seeing folks coming out with these horrible infected cuts. We weren't seeing the long term cases of unsolved cold cases. It was getting a lot better. During the pandemic, one of the big political things was undocumented immigrants being excluded from stimulus package from any government assistance. Undocumented immigrants lost their jobs too. They had no government safety net, unlike America and lawful permanent residents. How did Jews for Justice in Arizona assist that undocumented community who was left on their own without any safety net whatsoever. So we partnered up with various organizations who provided food, we provided masks, provided donations of water to other organizations that already had the process of helping undocumented families out. We sent masks over to Navajo Nation, to the Hopi Nation, where we have homemade masks. We have some moms who we employ to make them for us, and we send them all over the place. You're involved in some respect with the 10 camps on the Mexican side of the border where asylum seekers are now gathering and they have to wait and sleep there and live there due to the Trump administration's migrant protection protocols. Mm -hmm. What are you seeing there? Are you able to help any of them? We get calls from what they need. During Hanukkah and during Christmas, we sent over 200 toys individually packaged and individually wrapped to children who were in those shelters, as well as having communication with the pastors. What is going on? What do you need? And sending medication over as well. You lived your whole life here undocumented. Came here as a four-year-old. Uh, mm -hmm. You're in essence as American as me. You sound as American as me. You look as American as me. What do you want Americans who just got lucky to be born on the right side of the border? Basically it. It was luck to understand about undocumented people like yourself. We're just here to want the dream. We want to make it as bad as you want to make it. We want to grow and we want to elevate our community as much as anybody else here. We want the same pursuit of happiness that everybody else wants. We want to be able to go and pray to whoever we want to pray in the safety net of knowing we can do that. Raise our children in a place where we don't have to worry about violence or severe poverty. Being able to grow in a place where you're able to feel safe. And what would you say to the Americans who say undocumented aliens are taking our jobs? We don't have space in America for them. They're taking up our resources. The United States has a history of growing up in an immigrant-rich nation. Immigration is what brings the beauty into this great nation, brings us our melting pot, our diversity of cultures. When you have folks understand 
understand that if there was a certain pathway to citizenship, an unbroken path to our immigration system, then we would have access to it. We would do it the way that it's supposed to meant to be done. But when there is a broken system and when you are fearing for your life, you go to the places where you can see or feel that you have some sort of hope. If for folks who don't see that, I see it at, th- at this way. If something dramatically and violent happened in front of your house continuously, you gather up your kids and you move. You move wherever it's safe. You don't think twice about it. You don't think, okay, this is the steps I'm going to take. You just do it because you want to make sure that your family is safe and that you have prosperity and hope to make sure that they don't ever have to relive that. I'm just listening to you and I'm saying to myself, you know what I would say to those people? America is better because you're here in America than in Mexico. We are a better country because you are here. Like many, many people like yourself. We're a better country because of it. And you benefit this country, which benefits each and every person who lives in this country. And Eddie, we always ask everybody on our show, tell us what your American dream is. For one day, know that I don't have to fear deportation where I can go out and I have the ability to partake in my civic engagement and vote, where I have the ability to travel, where I can uplift my community and take care of our communities and create a better society that works for everybody. That is my American dream. How can people find out more about Arizona Jews for Justice and Ori Litsetic if they want to get involved? Most definitely follow us on Facebook, on all the social medias. We are on Instagram, on Facebook. Look up Ori Litsetic and Arizona Jews for Justice. Give us a like. Stay in touch with what we do. Eddie Chavez, thank you very much for coming on. Good luck with your work. My personal belief is that it will end up working out for everybody in DACA. You certainly deserve it. You've had a, quite a long journey to where you are today. And I uh, wish you the best of luck in the future. Thanks for coming on. I appreciate you. Thank you.